The brainstorming session is uh, Chris McMaster from Dalhousie University in Canada. Chris is an expert on uh, lipid metabolism and yeast and probably has more strains of uh, mutant uh, yeast in his freezer than I have uh, dollars in my pocket. So uh, Chris's talk today will, is entitled a Application of Lipidomics to Identify New Phospholipid Disorders. Not quite. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, yeast. I, I, was re I was reading, reading Fred's. Fred's going to give another talk. Uh, yeast genome-wide screens to assess the genetic landscape for Barth syndrome. Thank God. Fred, you're on again. <laughs> um, of course, I'd like to thank the organizers for thinking of me and, and asking me to come here. I, and the Barth Syndrome Foundation, and in particular the Barth Syndrome Foundation of Canada, I've had a very good relationship with them. We had them out to actually Dalhousie University in the fall, and we co-presented at Grand Rounds to the Department of Pediatrics to try and you know, raise awareness amongst the, the pediatric cardiologists and other specialists, and it did that, so that was great. Um, so some of the work that we've been doing on, on, on Barth syndrome right now is actually using a, a model organism people have uh, presented before, um, Steve and Miriam. And... And this is actually to use the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae to try and ascertain what modulates the cellular phenotypes that are both good and bad when the TAS gene is missing, essentially making a yeast model of Barth syndrome and then seeing can we make the cells happier or we can make them sicker. And so the way we do this is to use systematic genetics to identify genes that um, affect the fitness of cells that are inactivated for the, the Barth syndrome gene TAS1. Um, you know, it's much easier to identify modifier genes in either inbred or isogenic organisms than things that are out, outbred, and of course yeast are very easy, they can all be very isogenic. Um, and we can look for two kinds of genes, negative mo modifier genes. So these are genes that decrease the fitness of cells that contain in the, in the inactivated TAS1 gene, that's what I'm going to talk about. But also positive modifier genes, so genes that could increase the fitness of cells containing an inactivated, inactivated TAS genes. And then once these are identified, of course, we can confirm to these gen genetic interactions are they conserved all the way up the evolutionary tree or not. And a little more far-fetched, but possibly something worth giving a shot, would be are there polymorphisms or mutations in any of these genes that we identify in the model organisms found in Barth syndrome patients, and does this affect the severity of the disease progression? So could you use it prognostically or not? Um, so, in the search for negative modifier genes, you know, and when the TAS1 gene's inactivated, if you inactivate a second gene, of course, the cells will get sicker, and that's what we're looking for in this kind of a thing, and we did it in a systematic way. Um, and so this is really, crap, wrong button, the question we're asking. So these are serial dilutions, you know, wild-type cells grow just fine under, you know, essentially nutritional replete conditions when you in inactivate the TAS1 gene, these cells grow just fine. And then, you know, we're looking for when you inactivate a second gene, as yet unknown, but we hope to identify, you end up with a situation like this where, of course, the cells don't grow very well. There's a clear decrease in fitness, and it's primarily due to the fact that this gene, when combined with the TAS1 gene, causes that effect. So that's really what we were screening for. And so to do this, we bought a robot. And this takes advantage of the fact that there's about 6,200 genes in a yeast cell of about 5,000 are not essential. So you can inactivate about 5,000 of these 6,200 genes, and the cells grow just fine. So then we just have to ask the question, which of these 5,000 genes, when combined with a cell that has an inactivated TAS1 gene, does not grow very well? And you do this in triplicate, and you try and identify throughout the entire yeast genome which of these genes, in combination with the TAS1 gene, results in a sick cell. And so in plain English, basically, we're asking who dies, right? So, and this is essentially what the array looks like in the end, and you're looking for spots where there's no growth or decreased growth. And I won't go through the fancy genetics, but it's pretty straightforward to get your TAS gene in the same cell line or cell type as each of these 5,000 uh, non-essential genes in yeast. And so the major functions that we found, and I won't go through the gene lists for all of these, but I have them, and if you want them, I'll send them to you, um, that resulted in compromised fitness, in this case, growth of yeast cells that had an inactivated TAS1 gene. Uh, one was mitochondrial protein import, and actually Miriam had actually saw this as well, and this was the TOM5 gene. And this was, uh, she showed that in yeast cells, as also in, in cells from Barth syndrome patients that if this was compromised, there was, there was a decrease in mitochondrial protein import when the TAS1 gene was inactivated. And if you inactivated parts of the protein import pathway into the mitochondria, the cells got quite sick. 
Uh, I'm going to talk mostly about a protein called YME1 that we identified. It's involved in mitochondrial protein stability and quality control, and mention briefly a little bit about the arginosuccinate shunt because we pulled out the entire pathway here. Um, so in terms of mitochondrial protein stability and quality, we found that if you in inactivated the YME1 gene at the same time as the TAS1 gene, the cells were very, very sick. And so... Uh, what is YME1? YME1 is a catalytic subunit of the mitochondrial inner membrane IAAA protease complex. So basically it sits here in the inner membrane of the mitochondria and it's got a, a, a homologue that actually faces the other way around and faces the matrix. But here it faces the inner membrane part of the mitochondria and really what it's responsible for do is degrading um, unfolded or misfolded uh, mitochondrial proteins in the intermembrane space. Um, and one of its you know, best characterized subject, uh, substrates are, are components of complex four of the electron transport chain, and people like uh, uh, Steve, et cetera, they've looked at, they've, they've determined that uh, the electron transport chain, especially complex four, can actually um, not assemble quite properly in uh, cells lacking the TAS1 gene. It's also been implicated in the induction of mitophagy, this gene. And this is just proof that this is the case. So every place, so what you can take is you can take a cell that's been inactivated for YME1 and TAS1 as haploids, make a diploid and sporulate them, and you get the four products of the meiotic division. Um, one will be wild type, one will be lacking this gene, one will be lacking this gene, and one will be lacking both. And whenever both genes were missing, the cells you can see are growing a lot less robustly. And you can also take the cells and do serial dilutions and show it this way. Wild type TAS1 and YME cells all grow about the same rate, but when you inactivate both, they get quite sick. So, the genetic interaction is pretty clear. Uh, so, why are they getting sicker? That's the question you want to ask now, right? And so, we went through well, what are the functions of TAS, what are the functions of YME1, and which one of these is getting worse when you inactivate both together. Um, and so, the first thing we looked at was, of course, the phospholipid level. And what we found, so this is uh, cells lacking wild-type cells, and as you can see, this is mitochondria isolated from wild-type cells. And, of course, they've got their typical lipid con uh, uh, constitution here. These are two TAS mutants, and they accumulate monolysocardiolipin at the expense of cardiolipin, as expected. You knock out YME1, that's not the case. And if you knock out both, we actually don't see it being any worse than in the TAS mutants, and actually their phospholipid composition is identical to what you'd see in the TAS mutants, and this is just this quantified. This is the TAS1 knockout, and this is the double knockout in blue, so orange to blue, orange to blue, and all the levels remain the same. So there's not a huge defect in the phospholipid composition. That's, that's, that's not the problem that's being exacerbated when you, when you inactivate YME1. Um, it's been shown, of course, that the electron chain supercomplex formation um, is not formed quite properly in TAS1 yeast. So here you can see and inactivate the TAS1 cell, and this is uh, uh, the COX2, which is the component of uh, complex 4. And so this is the supercomplexes between complex 3 and complex 4. And you can see that uh, in TAS1 null cells, component COX2 um, actually uh, falls out. And so this supercomplex is being disassembled a little bit. In YME1 cells, this is not the case. And in the double mutant, it's also not the case. So um, that it almost actually fixes this a little bit, um, which is a little weird, but it's also very clear that it's not getting worse. If anything, it's getting better. So it's probably not a problem in super complex formation, which was kind of interesting. I thought this would probably be it before we started this because COX-2 is known to be one of the substrates of YME1. Now, so this might actually explain what's going on here because if you actually inactivate YME1, um, perhaps it stays assembled or not. But anyways... We don't, we don't have a good explanation other than it's, it's not really defective right now. Um, so instead of, so we're trying to figure out, well, we've sort of ruled out the two major things that we know um, about these things a little bit. Um, so let's just take some pictures and see if something arises. So these are electron micrographs. And, and this is a wild type E cell, and these dark spots here are the mitochondria, and they're very well behaved, and this is just a higher magnification. You can see lots of mitochondria in the cell. Um, if you knock out the TAS1 gene, this has been shown before, you tend to get slightly larger elongated mitochondria, but still a fairly high number of mitochondria in a lot of the cells. You knock out YME1, they actually look a little bit like the uh, TAS1 mitochondria. 
Um, you can see that they're starting to get big and ugly as well, and they're starting to lack cristae at the same time. Um, then when you inactivate both, it gets really gross, actually. A um, couple things happen. In a lot of the cells, the vacuole, which is the equivalent to the lysosome, gets very, very large, and you see these huge, in some cases, you see these huge mitochondria. In a lot of cases, they abut the vacuole, but they're obviously not, nothing's happening to them. And this is the same strain, but a different picture, and what you'll see is you'll see a lot of these larger mitochondria, and they all line up right beside the vacuole, but then they're not doing anything, so they're just stuck right beside the vacuole. So this made us think, well, what could be going on here? Well, we're either seeing really big mitochondria or we're seeing mitochondria that are also a little large lined up against the vacuole. And so there's mitochondrial fusion and fission that's con constantly taking place, and this is thought to be part of mitochondrial quality control as well. Um, and one of the things that's supposed to occur if your mitochondria are being wonky and misbehaved and getting damaged is they're supposed to undergo mitophagy. So that's the process by which cells take mitophagy, move them into the vacuole, and then degrade them into vacuole so that they can get rid of these poorly functioning mitochondria so they can't do any damage to the cell. And so we decided to look at perhaps that's the problem, especially with all these mitochondria lined up right beside the vacuole but not being able to get in. Is there a problem in mitophagy in these particular mutants? And so this is an assay that you can use in yeast cells to look at mitophagy. So OM45 is a protein that's integral to the uh, membrane of yeast cells, uh, of, to the mitochondrial membrane of yeast cells, and it's hooked up to GSP. And in this case, what we're doing here is we're inducing um, mitophagy by growing them on lactate and then taking out the nitrogen source, amino acids and nitrogen source, and this induces mitophagy in yeast cells. And what happens is your, if your mitochondria are being targeted to the vacuole, so this is a DIC and these indentations are the vacuole that you can see in these micrographs, you end up with OM45 GFP being targeted to the vacuole and actually this gets cleaved and GFP is actually quite resistant to being degraded by vacuolar proteases, so you see fluorescence of GFP within these vacuoles. And so you can see in wild type cells, as expected, a lot of the vacuoles are lighting up nice and bright and green because we've told them to undergo mitophagy, and they are. In the TAS cells, this is also happening quite efficiently in most of the cells as well. A lot of the vacuoles are nice, bright, and green. In the YME cells, again, you're starting to see this occurring in almost all the cells. The vacuoles are nice and bright and green in most of the cells. But when you look at the, the double knockout, you're seeing in a not all cells, but in a large number of cells, you're actually starting to see just the mitochondria, large mitochondria lying there, but they're actually not being targeted to the vacuole and degraded. So it looks like there might be a defect in mitophagy. And one way to get a better handle on quantifying this is you can do a Western blot. So as the OMP45 GFP, when it's in the mitochondria, it stays intact as a full-size protein. When it gets targeted to the vacuole and, gets, and mitophagy is occurring, this part gets chopped off, the OMP45 gets actually degraded, but the GFP is actually quite resistant to degradation by the proteases. So you just do a Western blot versus GFP. And look at the proportion of OM45 GFP chimera to just GFP. And so when we did this, this is just under control. You know, we're not inducing mitophagy. And here when we do induce mitophagy, you can see in the wild type cells there's a lot of GFP, a lot of mitophagy. Inactivate TAS1 a little less, SWIME1 a little less, and you know, inactivate both, there's a lot less mitophagy going on. So the defect that's probably leading to these cells being very sick is the fact that they can't undergo mitophagy and get rid of damaged mitochondria. And the buildup of damaged mitochondria is making the cells sick. So this is the main take-home message. There's mitophagy defects are exacerbated in the absence of the TAS1 gene when the IAAA protease YME M1 involved in mitochondrial intermembrane space quality control is also defective. So if you lose a little bit of quality control, you can't undergo mitophagy. Um, this is another set of genes we pulled out from our screen, and this has to do with the arginosuccinate shunt. So we also pulled out both these genes here, ARG11, ARG3, ARG1, and this is almost the entire arginosuccinate shunt other than this last step, and they're involved in synthesizing arginine. So inactivation of the TAS gene is synthetic sick with all of these guys. And as has been reported, there's a decrease in arginine level in Barth patients. So that, that if you already have a decrease in arginine level and now you can't make arginine, this is, makes a lot of sense. 
but we haven't gone on to confirm this or explore this biochemically or throughout cell biology. I'm also by no means an expert in this pathway, so if there are people around that are experts, I'd be more than happy to send you lots of yeast strains or collaborate on any level you want to actually explore this possibility as well. So I'd like to, to thank everybody, of course, for listening. I'd like to thank the Barth Syndrome Foundation, of course, and the people who pay me. I'd like to point out that all this work was done by a, a graduate student, Gerard Gaspard, um, who's uh, expecting to graduate from my lab around Christmas. So if people are looking for a postdoc with some experience in this level, please give me a, a ring. And thank you again. Questions for Chris? Ron? Chris, a fantastic work. Uh, in this last set of experiments, could you rescue the defect actually by simply throwing in arginine? We haven't gone there. We should try that. He's, he's only one guy, so I've been... And in these pathways, <laughs> which, you, which you showed, that's basically the same as we have in, uh, in mammals. Yeah. Going all the way from ammonia to carbon phosphate, ornithine, citrulline, etc. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm much more interested in the rescue mutants. Have you found any of those? Yeah, no. So what we'd like to do, and of course the next screen we'd love to do is actually. Um, do the screen where we'd actually find genes that when inactivated allows for better growth of the TAS1 cells. So when you inactivate the TAS1 gene in yeast, they grow just fine on glycolytic carbon sources, but they grow poorer when you actually feed them carbon sources, which make them use their mitochondria to respire as the sole source of energy. Um, that's really true as we were talking about yeast, you know, um, cell lines. It's really true for most yeast cell lines. The one that's used for the robotic arraying, it's not true for and so we've tried to figure that out. And actually, all the yeast genome, many of the yeast genomes have been sequenced. And the reason we think this might be a problem, and this is the thing we're actually looking to solve right now, is there's a transposon insertion in one of the genes required to synthesize heme in the robot strain. And so we think perhaps that's the reason we might not be seeing this effect. So we're trying to fix that. We're trying to prove that's the case. And then if we can just fix that gene using standard recombination, we should be able to do the screen. So that's on the books to do uh, as quickly as we can. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm uh, intrigued by the uh, double mutant, the triple A proteinase yeah. and plus the, um, the type of the mutant. Um, you show there is a fusion defect or a sufficient defect, and if you if you um, um, Treat the cell with, uh, let's say, inhibitor of. Uh, if it is fusion defect, you can manipulate it in one way with uh, a treatment that, that promote a, uh, uh, but inhibit the fusion, or other way around. Yeah. And and have you um, done that? And if so, if it is, I just try to localize at what stage the mitophagy defect is. If you look at the different markers like LC3, pink one, and what their expression and, and processing and so on. Yeah, we, you know, the fact that the mitochondria are primarily huge makes me think it's probably um, a fission defect, um, but I'm not entirely sure. I think Miriam might answer this question for me more eloquently, <laughs> so I'll let her do that. <laughs> well, uh, I just wanted to uh, throw in that uh, the CRD1 mutant, which is more severe than the TAS1, does have a fusion defect, okay. so uh, it, it's it's. You know, it's l likely that this is uh, just a milder um, fusion defect, milder than than the um, TAS one, and also the CRD1 mutant also has a um, uh, seems to have a mitophagy defect as well okay. that you would that, that you would see not in the double mutant form, just a single mutant. Right. Uh, I found in your mitophagy pictures actually the third. Delta ME1, the image same as Y type, if single, just a single, yeah. single delta. If a double delta, yeah. looks terrible, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cell, cell image disappear. Yeah. Only maybe mitochondrial debris there, right? Yeah. But for type one deletion, you can see huge color there. Yeah. 
that means very strong mitophagy there, yeah. only in delta tars. Yeah, well, doesn't the, bother about VME1. But the, if VME1 joined, yeah. only thing is a cellized mitochondrial maintain. Yeah, so you're saying there's just, this looks brighter than this. Um, yeah, very big and strong in delta tars. Yeah, so I'm not entirely sure if we but, can But uh, in delta VME1, situation like uh, whiter. Yeah, so I, I don't know if I'd be confident in the amount of fluorescence that you see because it depends on how long you expose and, how, you know, we didn't make everything perfect in terms of, you know, having these pictures um, discern at least through the amount of fluorescence how much mitophagy was going on uh, that way. We were really just looking for are we going to see fluorescence in the vacuole or see fluorescence that's still part of mitochondria. We didn't correlate with the amount of fluorescence correlating with the amount of mitophagy. I think the Western blot is what correlates the amount of mitophagy a lot better. It's much more quantitative. And in this case, these two guys are, well, close to equivalent, I guess, a little bit less than wild type, and this is dramatically less than all three. In, in, the, in Drosophila, we have certainly seen an increase in the uh, proportion of damaged mitochondria in, yeah. in the, after uh, deletion of the fasin. We have always thought it's because well, they make more damaged mitochondria, but now you're saying, well, they all make the same mitochondria, but in the Tafarsin mutant, they can't get rid of the mitochondria that naturally get damaged in the, in the normal course of events, right? Is that so? It could be that there's a, a, an increase in damaged mitochondria in the TAS mutants, but then they also can't get rid of these damaged mitochondria. What's the feasibility of doing a gain or loss of function screen for uh, variants that rescue the TAS phenotype? Yeah, so that's what we were thinking of as well, and that's what we're, we're hoping to do. The problem is the background yeast strain that we use to do these robotics um, does not show a robust decreased growth on non-fermentable carbon sources, and we think we know why. We think it has to do with a, a gene involved in heme synthesis where there's a, a defect in the robot strain that's normally not present in most yeast strains. So we've just got to replace the defective gene with the wild type gene, and we're doing that now to confirm that's the case. And if that truly does fix things, and I think it will, then we can actually do the same kind of screen for genes that are um, that was, would allow you to rescue that phenotype, which would be cool because those would be potential sort of drug target types of, of, of genes we'd identify, right? So. Well, we think we know the gene that's the problem. We think it's a transcription factor that controls heme synthesis that is uh, inactivated due to a transposon insertion in, in the robot strain, just eons back when they were deciding, you know, because there's about four different wild-type yeast strains that are out there that labs have used in the, over the last 50, 60 years. Um, and three out of the four do not have this transposon insertion, but uh, the, the, the strain they use to make the robot, the deletion collection does, and so we've got to get rid of that. And I think if we do, we'll, uh, we'll fix that phenotype, which is a cool genetic interaction in and of itself, and we'll probably explore that separately. Um, but we can all, it'll also allow us to do the, uh, the high-throughput screen. Okay, if there are no more questions, thanks very much, Chris. <laughs>